Welcome back to the Regina 120. I am Jeff Cliff, and this is a series of videos of 120 things that I think that you should know. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the argument from silence, or the argumentum e silentio, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, which is an argument uh, using the ev or absence of evidence as evidence, uh, rather than the existence of evidence as evidence for its conclusion. So going back to what does an argument look like, and this should be you know, starting to look pretty familiar given how many of these logical fallacies we've touched on here. So we're going to start with nothing. We're going to follow it with nothing. And from that, we're going to conclude a conclusion. Now notice that there are two things that are missing here. Uh, which is that there are no premises here. Uh, there is a conclusion that is being assumed rather than proven. It is an argument that is trying to be look as though it is a legitimate argument, when in fact it is just a statement of a conclusion. It is a, when written out in this most basic form, we have no evidence leading to the assumption of evidence, or, or no evidence leading to a conclusion. Thinking back to one of the previous videos, we talked about the Carl Sagan, you know, there's a dragon in my garage scenario. This is another kind of example of that, where there's a dragon right here. How do we know that there's a dragon? Well, how do you don't know that there's a, dr a dragon there? What, you know, how do you, how do you not, or why do you think that there isn't a dragon? You know, is, is there a problem that, you know, you don't take my word that there's a, a dragon right, right next to me here? You know, it's ridiculous. Nobody has the, the grounds to, to make statements like that. With, with, and when questioned to provide evidence, and there is no evidence, you know, you can't assume that they're correct. Uh, there's almost no situation when that is, at, in fact, appropriate. Here, you know, the Simpsons have, have pulled this all the time, where Homer Simpson will say, well, I didn't not do this, or, you know, kind of flip the double negatives around until the situation uh, applies. You know, the, the, the double negative flipping is another thing where, which is kind of common here. Uh, again, you know, is there ev any evidence that this, you know, what you're trying to get across or what you're, the person who's trying to argue with you is trying to get across? Any evidence whatsoever? Is there anything, any reason to believe what it is you're saying or, or, or being told? That is the question. Here's, a, here's another example of this kind of argument, you know, where someone, usually your significant other, will ask, you know, does this picture or this outfit, or outfit make me look fat? And your response is absolutely nothing because anything you say can and will be used against you, right? So you remain silent. What is the conclusion that you, you know, the significant other draws from that? Obviously it makes them look fat. Well, that's wrong because there are many reasons why you could be silent. You could be not paying attention whatsoever. You could be trying to weigh the possibilities of saying, you know, yes or no and just didn't come to the conclusion fast enough. You could uh, actually believe one thing or the other, but you know, realize that you, it's not in your best interest to say it, so you could just be completely sil silent. Either way, you know, trying to assume that they think one or the other based on silence is not necessarily appropriate uh, in almost every situation. Uh, conspiracy theories, and conspiracy theorists love this. Uh, they will come up with a, well, you know, they, or whoever the, the big, you know, conspiracy is, you know, you know, the, why aren't they doing this? Or do we have any evidence that they're not, you know, in, in league with each other? Or the one I was just reading, you know, the 9-11 the truthers, uh, you know, setting aside for the moment, what, whatever you believe about 9-11, the, the, the reason why, you know, th their argument was, well, our, our prominent truthers don't get on television nearly as much as we'd like. Therefore, the conclusion we're going to draw from that is the media is also in on it, and you know, there not only is there a large conspiracy about knocking these towers down, but there's also this you know media consolidation conspiracy. Now, again, there may even be some kind of a, you know, a media conspiracy we're, we're talking about, but you can't draw that conclusion merely from the fact that people who, in polite conversation, may look a little crazy, uh, don't get on TV to espouse their you know beliefs as often as they do. That is not the only conclusion you can draw from that particular piece of evidence. So, uh, again, it's, it's, it's just something you will see if you look in the, the various kind of alternative and conspiracy circles. Uh, this will come up. 
Here's another example that might even be a lot more controversial than that. Uh, the precautionary principle. What is per the precautionary principle? Uh, it's root. It is the assumption that because we don't know enough about something or we have no evidence for or against something, we should be more cautious and not use the technology that we have to the utmost that we understand it's capable of on the, the possibility that it could do us harm. Now, again, there may be reasons why you should believe that. However, in the very base of it, there is a logical fallacy being made, which is that we have no evidence, therefore we should act as if we had evidence. You know, that we're treating this non-evidence as evidence. So, you know, at least think carefully if you're going to apply the precautionary principle on what it is you're about to do and whether or not it's valid to apply it in this particular case and whether the probability uh, can be measured at all and whether it's worth doing so and being careful about that. Um, and so kind of going again back to the previous video and some of the uh, ones before it, there, it, it can't be stated enough that for practically all of these logical fallacies, there's a way of arguing in this sense where it's not completely invalid. Again, going back to the precautionary principle. You know, yes, you can look at the precautionary principle and view it as, you know, nothing other than a logical fallacy, which it practically is. But there's also, you know, reasons for, for using it and reasons for uh, treating it at least seriously. Uh, even if you, at the root, uh, know that you're committing some kind of a fallacy by using it. Um, but again, it's, it's it does the context you're in uh, justify? Does the context you're in uh, provide evidence that you're actually, or you should be doing things you know, with this particular type of argument? Um, and can you use it in a way that isn't liable to lead you astray? These are questions you should be asking. So uh, another uh, situation where it may be appropriate to use an argument from silence, if you're careful enough about it, it it's in history specifically in history of, of science and the history of where there's written records. If you can look at an uh, author who's written something long enough ago that they would have made comment on some other author or some topic had they known about it, and yet they do not, in history at least, it's expected and standard practice to assume, or at least argue from that, that they didn't know about that other author or they didn't know about that other topic. Again, this is actually as clear as day an example of the argument from silence. And yet it's standard practice in history because most of the time, if an author doesn't refer to an author, that he probably didn't know about. There may be situations where, where there's uh, an exception to this rule. Uh, for example, if the author didn't like the other author and just wanted to make sure that when history recorded him talking about things relating to this other author, that this other author never gets mentioned and is kind of erased from the history books. This happens. But again, you need to find, going back to one of the other previous videos, you know, the Occam's razor. Look, is this an extra hypothesis you would have to believe? All worth keeping in mind. But the question, regardless of whether or not you're trying to make an argument from silence that is or is not uh, fallacious in nature, the question is about the burden of proof and who has the burden of proof and how much proof is necessary in order to, I guess, come up with a valid argument. How much, you know, evidence, how much, uh, how valid do the premises have to be in order to come to the conclusion? If the, they're not, if, if, if you don't meet the burden of proof, you've practically committed this as is. Um, the legal system has a different level of a burden of proof than, say, the advertising system. Uh, you want to be very sure that if you're about to execute someone for doing something, that you know that they did it, compared to just sending a flyer or a spam email or something to them. Uh, or, or you know, some some kind of a, a an invitation to your service. You know, even if you are, are you know if you send an invitation to your service to the wrong person, you know they may just not show up. That's not a huge deal. Or or again, compare and contrast the legal system to an angry mob. If you've got an angry mob, you know they'll just go after anyone you point at. So again, it's the, the burden of proof is different, and you may be able to get away with uh, more and less valid arguments from silence with each of these different situations. And uh, uh, another thing where it could potentially be, or where it could be used in a valid way, we'll talk about later when we get to Bayes' rule, but that's for another video. Um, so we won't quite get there again. So, uh, 
So um, another thing worth pointing out here is that, uh, it, especially when you're dealing with what you think the other person in a situation is, is saying or is intending or is, or is guilty of, it is a uh, very likely that uh, when you try to model what it is that's in the other person's head, that you're not taking full account of what they know or what they think or what they want or etc. We, we tend to overestimate how much we know about other people and their mental thought or processes and their thoughts and what they're thinking of. We assume that you know they know what we're thinking and we know what they're thinking, even when we have evidence to the contrary. So if you have no information other than what you think someone else thinks, try to be a little bit more skeptical about you know what you're concluding based on. Uh, if, if you know, especially when you're assigning guilt to things. You know, if they don't say anything, again, that's not necessarily something that automatically means that they think what you think that they're thinking. You know, and again, going back to a previous video when we were talking about, you know, did you use all of your data? Um, well, the second question here is, did you use none of your data? Because if you use none of your data, then your conclusion is garbage. You need to go back, collect some data, and actually come up with a conclusion that's supported by it. Otherwise, you're committing the argument of silence, your argument or your thought process or your reasoning is no good. Go try again, you know, insert another coin. Thank you for coming. So hopefully this has been a valuable uh, video for you. Uh, if you have any questions or would like to make some conclusions based on no data or input at all and just you know want to yell into the your computer, go for it. Um, there will be comment threads available anywhere where this video is posted. And if you have uh, any questions or concerns, please feel free to leave them. Hopefully you enjoy. See you next video.